7 from verse 1 to 15. Okay, I will read. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and poor devo devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaim another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you received a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a, dif a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior of, the, of these super apost apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way, we have made this plain to you in all things. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself, myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge, I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was indeed, I did not burden anyone, for my brothers who come from Macedonia supplied my needs, my need, sorry. So I refrain and will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the religious, in the religion, in the regions of Achia. And why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. And what am I doing? I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of, of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same term, terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disgusting themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disgusts disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise in his servants. Also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. That's the word of the Lord. Thank you so much, uh, Sister Cecilia, for reading for us that text. I'd like to also take this opportunity to thank the elders of Grace Point Church Kikuyu for inviting me to share with you God's word as we think about how to combat the challenge of false teaching. Uh, receive greetings from uh, my local church, Emmanuel Baptist Church, uh, the elders of the church, as well as the members that I was able to share with, the news of coming to preach here, uh, sent me with their greetings. Before we delve into God's word, I would like for us to indulge in prayer one more time. Heavenly Father, we plead with you that you would impress upon our hearts the need the urgency to pursue spiritual discernment as the only way in which we will protect ourselves from the danger, from the present danger of false teaching. 
I pray that you would grant me the ability to speak about these things with humility and sober-mindedness. That if there be any among us who has indulged in or has been affected by false teaching, that they will see your mercy. I pray that this someone will not be retributive, but restorative. I ask, O oh God, that you would grant me boldness to grant the truth of the nature of deception, but also grant the truth of your triumph over deception. I plead these things before you, asking and believing in Christ Jesus. Amen. Brothers and sisters, my goal uh, in this sermon is to convince you that spiritual discernment is the solution to deception. I seek to convince you that spiritual discernment is the solution to deception. If you'd like to write it any other way, you would say biblical discernment is the antidote to deception. Biblical discernment is the antidote to deception. It was 24 years ago in a village called Kanungu in Uganda. A famous movement by the name the movement of the restoration of the Ten Commandments, which was an offshoot of the Roman Catholic Church, was teaching a different gospel. Uh, they taught that Jesus Christ was going to come at the beginning of the century. And those who would associate themselves and follow the teachings of this movement would save themselves from the coming judgment. And so the news spread out uh, through Uganda and people came from different places, even from Kenya and different places in East and Central Africa, uh, to gather in this church to await for the coming of Jesus. And the day that was announced came. The hours were ticking and the clocks were being watched closely. But Jesus did not come, as you may guess. And so what happened is uh, those who were given the mandate to watch over these people began to notice that the people were frustrated. And every one of those who made some kind of indication of their frustration was bundled out and murdered in the forest. Uh, by the time the uproar was rising, almost 500 people had already died. And so the leaders of this group locked the church from the outside and lit the church on fire. And more than 500 people died. It has been known as the famous Kanungu tragedy. Coming closer home, just a year from now, last year, we heard the story of the Shakahola massacre. Well, in that story, there was a gentleman by the name Paul McKenzie who taught the very same things, almost the same things as those that were taught by the movement of the restoration of the Ten Commandments. In fact, the unique thing about this movement was that they wanted to separate themselves from the present realities of this earth. Uh, this leader said, you need not to go for education. Uh, he said, you need not visit the hospitals. He said, the world and its systems are evil, and so let's come and separate ourselves as we await the coming of Jesus. In fact, if you want to quicken your time to meeting Jesus, we are going to offer an, an opportunity for you to fast your way to Jesus. And so, uh, people bundled up their families and went to Shakahola Forest. 
And as we speak, more than 416 people have been found in shallow mass graves. As you're listening to these stories, you would say, surely it can never happen to me. Look, I am so smart. I have taken an education and I have been taught so well. Why should I be disturbed about these things? Such was the situation in the church in Corinth. Uh, Paul had planted this church in his first missionary journey, and as he's writing these letters, he is writing with concern about the spiritual maturity of this church. Uh, We see many situations. They do not know how to partake the Lord's table with sobriety and with carefulness. They have divisions among them. Uh, There is people among them who are living a very sinful life and they have not been brought to book. Uh, But there is also this challenge. Uh, There is a challenge of false teachers. Uh, The false apostles, the super apostles. And it is with this that Paul writes uh, with concern. He is writing in the context of certain people who are calling themselves super apostles, uh, teachers who had been known for their rhetoric, their persuasion, their charisma, their charm, uh, their eloquence and etiquette. Uh, They were loved for their confidence. In fact, in the Greek culture, if you had just enough confidence and wheat, you would be paid. People would pay for, to listen to you. And so these guys were bugging enough money. Their ratings were high. Well, on the opposite side, Paul and many others who were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ were not asking for money. And so Paul is trying to solve this problem by pointing the Corinthians to even the bigger problem. He is seeking to call the Corinthians to sober thinking. He wants them to wake up from the danger they are in and be on guard for they are being seduced into abandoning their faith in God. Grace Point Church Kikuyu, I want to ask you three questions and in these three questions are going to guide our time together in the next few minutes. First, can believers be deceived? Can believers be deceived? A second question, what is the nature of deception? What is the nature of deception? The third question, what is the solution to the problem of deception? Can believers be deceived? What is the nature of deception? And what is the solution to deception? First, let us explore the first question. Can believers be deceived. Paul says here, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. For, notice, I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin. Paul's jealousy here is the same kind of jealousy that God has over Israel as you see in the book of Hosea chapter 2. And verse 19, it is a time when Israel is turning their back on him. Paul had labored among the people of Corinth and blessings upon blessings upon blessings of God had come. And many had come to faith and praise God there was a church. But Paul, just like any other best man... Or, no, 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 not best man, but best maid, is concerned that the very bride that he is going to present before God has been distracted. This bride is changing her loyalty to another man. So, as their spiritual father, 
as indicated in 1 Corinthians 4, 15, he has betrothed them to one husband, but he is beginning to be fearful of their purity. Notice what he says. He says, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts, your what? Your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. From this statement, these are believers. They have a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Yet, Paul is afraid for them that they are about to be deceived. Dear friends, we need to be careful about what sociologists have called the not-me syndrome. Uh, you see people gullible and being deceived into selling out their properties and leaving their families and dying, and you say, surely not me. Uh, but what you're trying to say is you are not careful enough to realize that deception comes so easily. Well, the second question we must ask ourselves is how? How do they deceive? How do they manage to remove Christians from a pure devotion to Christ? What is the nature of this deception that makes Christians fall for it? Well, Paul decides to give an object lesson here. And he draws the Corinthian attention to the very story that all of them are familiar with, the story of the Garden of Eden. And Paul says, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Oh, praise God that the saints at Grace Point have a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Praise God that you pray every day. Uh, praise God that you read your Bible. Uh, praise God that you have given off yourself to Christ to serve him with all your life. Uh, because he saved us, didn't he? Uh, he laid down his life and died on a cruel cross to purchase you and I for his glory. And the reason why you are here and lovingly listening to God's word and seeing how you might apply it is because God has given you a sincere and pure devotion to him. Uh, but Paul is afraid. And so should we be afraid. And first, Paul compares the nature of deception with what happened to Eve in the Garden of Eden. This is the famous story in Genesis chapter 3 from verse 1 to 7. Now, if you would indulge me, please turn to Genesis chapter 3 from verse 1 to 7. Well, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the meat of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Notice verse 6. So when the woman saw that the, trees were, the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to, his, to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and 
she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Verse 7, then the eyes of both were open and they knew that they were naked. And they showed, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Well, this was a famous story even then as it is now of the fall of man. One of the things that we learn from this is that deception is an old age problem. It just didn't start 24 years ago. It did not start last year. It has always been with us. Uh, the second thing we learn here is that deception is not always obvious. Well, it's been there for so long, so you would assume it's obvious, but it is not always obvious. You see, the way the serpent approached Eve is the same way deception comes today. Even the best of us can fall prey. Even the best of the Bible study leaders in our group, even the best of the elders you have, even the best of the professors of theology that you have can fall prey. It does not matter whether you have a PhD or a double PhD, you will fall, a prey, will fall prey of deception. Jesus Christ in Matthew 7 verse 15 says, Watch out for false prophets, for they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are what? Ravenous wolves. Well, the third thing that we learn is deception in the garden went through some stages. It, it did not just come, but it took stages. The first stage was doubt. Uh, the serpent questioned God's word. He said, did, you, did God really say? Did God really say? Well, that was enough seed to cast doubt in Eve's mind. God's word had been distorted. God's word has, had been doubted. The second stage was that of denial. From doubt then, from denial. Uh, Satan denied God's warning of death upon disobedience. You know you shall not die. Come on. You know he was joking. It's never that serious. And Eve was like, hmm, tell me more. It's that radio station or that television station that you watch. That's where your favorite preacher comes on board. And he begins by saying, it is not God's will for you to suffer. You're like, hmm, that sounds good. In fact, it sounds true. In fact, God never said anywhere that his people will suffer. In fact, did you know that Jesus was rich? And he had bodyguards and he had a donkey. And <laughs> like, by the way, I never thought of that. But notice the third thing that the devil does is he distorts. He distorts God's word and he distorts God's goodness and he distorts God's character. He says, God knows on the day you eat of it, you shall have knowledge or good and evil and you shall become like him. That was not in Eve's Bible at that point. It was not in Adam's Bible at that point. At least, it was not in their minds. That was not what God told them. Uh, but the last stage is the one that we dread most. Uh, the last stage is the reason we are all here. The last stage is the reason Christ came. Uh, this last stage is destruction. What started as a harmless conversation ended up with Adam and Eve cast out of the garden. And let me tell you, if you're here and you're an unbeliever, if you do not believe in Christ, 
if you continue to believe in the lie that your works will save you, if you continue to believe in the lie that religion and the law and doing those good works will save you from sin, there is no other way to back to Eden than through Christ. That door was shut because of deception. And it will remain shut if you continue to listen to the deceiving voice of the serpent who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking for whom to devour. And so I call you to listen to the voice of one who says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. You will never see that Eden again if you do not trust in Christ. Shun the deceptive voice of the enemy who tells you you're comfortable in your unbelief and run to Christ who saves all who come to him in faith and repentance. Paul uses this example to warn the Corinthians of the danger of deception and how it comes in ways least expected. But dear friends, there are, there are many other places in the New Testament where Paul warns against false teaching. In fact, if you didn't know this, all the books of the New Testament, except the book of Philemon, have warnings upon warnings upon warnings upon warnings against false teachers. Paul says they oppose the truth in 2 Timothy 3 verse 8. He says in Ephesians 4.14, they use trickery, craftiness, deceitful scheming. They disguise themselves as sheep, as Jesus tells us in Matthew 7. Paul says in verse 13 of our text of the day, they, are apost they claim to be apostles of Christ, servants of righteousness, verse 15. These people deceive with false words. Peter says in 2 Peter 2, 3, they deceive with empty words. Ephesians 5, 6, uh, they deceive with empty deception in accordance with human tradition and the elementary principles of the world. Paul warns in Colossians against those who come to you with hollow and what? Deceptive philosophies. And telling you what you should eat and not eat, what you should dress and not dress, which days of the week you should go to service and church, you should worship. They have persuasive arguments, Colossians 2.4. They have smooth and flattering speech, Romans 16.18. In Jude, verse 16, he says, they use flattery for the sake of gaining an advantage. Well, they cause dissensions. They draw away disciples after themselves. These were the words of Paul in Acts chapter 20 and verse 30, when he was warning the Ephesian elders on his farewell speech that they will come from among you those who will teach a different gospel. They entice unstable souls. Dear saint, you must be a stable soul. You need to anchor your faith. You need to know what you believe because the devil is coming through the false teachers and the false apostles and the false prophets and they will come to entice you if you are unstable. It says here they, are, they employ stilt. They creep in unnoticed. They come to your Bible study. Or they knock your door in the evening and want to pray for you. They are on your YouTube thing. You know, you open your scroll and you see, wow, this is an amazing preacher who has, who's preaching to 5,000 people. I love how he uses his Greek when he is speaking and quoting all these words and the miracles, the signs, the wonders, the prophecies. 
You see, Peter says they secretly introduce destructive heresies. They slip into households and captivate their victims. We've had very many stories as a ministry of families that have been destroyed because of false teaching. The husband goes to work, leaves uh, the wife at home with the kids, and the Jehovah's Witnesses come knocking at the door, and the wife lets, lets them in, and they start having conversations, and before the husband knows, the wife is not going to the same church anymore. And two years later, the marriage is split. We've had so many stories of how many families have been wrecked through the teachings of Prophet David O'War. And the list goes on and on and on and on. These are false brothers who sneaked in to spy on our freedom in order to enslave us. Galatians 2 verse 4 says, they exploit others. They make merchandise of you. Oh, how many preachers have made merchandise of people. Bring your monies and you will receive a hundredfold. So you take a loan and take all your savings and give them to the man of God. And the next day, the kids are going hungry. <clears throat> they are physically abusive. They deny the master who brought them. They deny our only master and Lord, Jude says. They take their stand on the basis, the basis of visions. Uh, they delight in worship of angels. They are always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Uh, Paul says in 1 Timothy, they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. Don't think they are smart. Uh, the writers of scripture think they are foolish. They do not know what they say. What do they teach? Verse 4 of our text, for if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus uh, than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Uh, from this text, we see that they, uh, they teach another Jesus. They teach that Jesus was the best, simply, was simply the best man who ever lived, uh, the best teacher. The Jews teach that Jesus was simply a man who seemed to know enough. The Muslims teach that Jesus was at best a prophet of God. The Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus was Michael the Archangel. The Mormons, or ra rather the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints, teach that Jesus is just one of the many gods. And even you, if you live rightly and do all the things we ask you to do, you will also become a god. But you see, brothers and sisters, the true Jesus is the Son of of the living God, the one who was with God and was God, the one in whom all the fullness of God dwells bodily, the one who died for our sins and rose from the dead, as foretold in the Old Testament. Christ, the Christ we worship, is the one who teaches that many will be lost and requires an obedient faith. That is our Christ. It was and he is a truly man and truly God. That is our Christ. But you see, they not only teach another Jesus, but they also teach a different spirit. It says here uh, they, that, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received. Well, the spirit of the gospel is the spirit of truth. 1 John 4, 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. He goes on to say in verse 6 of 1 John 4, We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. 
meaning the apostles. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. So the spirit with which these super apostles, with which these false teachers, with which these false prophets come, is the spirit of falsehood. It is a different spirit. It's not just the, another Jesus, neither is it just a different spirit, but it is also a different gospel. Galatians 1.6, Paul writing to the church in Galatia, and here's the problem the Galatians were facing. The, the Galatians had these Judaizers among them who said, it is not only enough that you believe in Christ, but you must also be circumcised, and you must also fulfill the Jewish laws for you to be fully saved. Paul, when he came across this information, he writes in Galatians 1.6 and says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him whom you called, him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Dear brothers and sisters, when you turn to a different gospel, you desert Christ. When you turn to a different gospel, you desert him who called you in the grace of Christ. That is why this is dangerous. It's not just that you will lose your physical life in death, but you will lose eternal life. We must dread the danger of deception. There are those who teach that salvation is by faith and good works. The Roman Catholics and the Seventh-day Adventists and the Mormons and the list goes on and on. There are those who teach that salvation must and should be accompanied by good life, full of health and wealth. That if you are saved, you must not suffer. If you are suffering, it's because you do not have enough faith. They will say things like, the miracle is in your mouth. Say it, and you have it. It's almost like witchcraft, isn't it? <laughs> but we know those people, don't we? We know them because we interact with them on our YouTube pages. We know them because they are on Facebook, they are on your televisions, they are on your radios. In fact, I was listening to one today in, on my way here. There are those who teach a hyper-grace doctrine that now that you have been saved, you can leave whatever and however you want. Because anyway, God has saved your spirit. You can do anything you want with your body. Dear friends, these are preachers of a different gospel. Paul says they are evil people. They are imposters, hypocritical liars with seared consciences, men of depraved mind worthless in regard to the faith, rebellious, empty talkers. They are those of depraved mind and deprived of the truth. Jesus calls them false Christs, false prophets, savage, ravenous wolves. Peter calls them false teachers, stains and blemishes, untaught, unstable, unscrupulous, greedy, their eyes are full of adultery that never ceases from sin. Their hearts are trained in greed. That is what Peter says in 2 Peter 2.14. Jude says they are ungodly persons. He says they are grumblers. He says they are following after their own lusts in Jude 16. This is who they are. You see, they come with sheep clothing. So you will be like, that's such a nice man. Did you see that he just bought food for that children's home down the street? 
Didn't you see that he just healed a leper? Didn't you see that he called fire from heaven? Oh, didn't you see that he prayed and it never rained? And so we are deceived by these good works. And Jesus says in Matthew 7 that they will come to him and say, Did we not do many mighty works in your name? And Jesus says, Depart from me, you workers. Of what? Iniquity. But dear sins, Paul here is saying that they are like their father, the devil. They are serpent-like. Verse 14, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants, whose servants are they? The serpent's servants, disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Now, dear friends, it is my hope that by now you can see how dangerous false teaching is. Paul said earlier in our text that just as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. The question you must be asking is how do I ensure that my thoughts are not led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. You see, dear friends, false teachers will rob you of the privilege to be with Christ eternally. That is what they are after. If you believe a different gospel, you have nothing but death and judgment to expect. In the end of verse 15... Paul says their end will correspond to their deeds. And I must say, so will their followers end correspond to their deeds. Philippians 3.19 says, those who walk as enemies of the cross, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. You must turn away from any form of false teaching. It must never be contained. It must never be entertained. Paul says in his letter to Timothy that the church is the pillar and bulwark of truth. As a church, God has given you the mandate to be responsible for the who and what of the gospel. You welcome in members through baptism and say, we acknowledge that this and this and this have believed. And you also decide on the what is the gospel through what you decide to listen to as it's being preached. Paul says in 2 Timothy, they have gathered to themselves teachers teaching what their itching ears want to hear. Who's responsible there? The one who gathers to himself. So do not just stand and blame. If you sit under any teaching that is false, you are responsible. And that's what the church exists to do to guard the gospel of Christ. So what is the solution? What is the solution? I submit to us, as I started out, that spiritual discernment is the antidote to deception. Spiritual discernment is the antidote to deception. Tim Charles defines spiritual discernment this way. He says, it is the skill of understanding and applying God's word with the purpose of separating truth from error and right from wrong. Truth from error, right from wrong. A famous preacher by the name Charles Spurgeon defined discernment this way. He said, discernment is the ability not only to differentiate between truth and error, but to differentiate between truth and almost truth.
You see, the Corinthian problem in 2 Corinthians 11 is that they lacked spiritual discernment. If you are grounded in the faith and you are growing in, in, your gra in grace, you'll be able to guard yourself against false teaching. Believers who are grounded in the faith, who are growing in grace, are able to guard their faith. Grounded in the truth, in the faith, growing in grace, guarding the faith. So what should be our response as we go home? I submit to us that our attitude should be that of watchfulness. Paul says, see to it that there is no one who takes you captive in Colossians 2.8. Colossians 2.18, he says, take care that no one keeps defrauding you of your prize. In Romans 16.17, he says, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. In 2 Peter 3.17, Peter says, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unscrupulous people and lose your own firm commitment. So our attitude should be that of watchfulness towards deceivers. But our attitudes towards ourselves should be that of sober humility. Don't you think that you are not susceptible? Jude 17 to 21 says, You, beloved, remember the words that were spoken bef beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that in the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts who cause divisions, wildly minded, devoid of the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking forward to the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, he says, therefore let no one think, let, let the one who thinks he stands watch out so that he does not fall. You must always be on your guard. What, what, what about the ones who are deceived? And it's possible that there are some here. Don't want to presume. We must show them mercy. I know it's possible for you to be cruel and to get out here and get a phone call and say, I have just heard you're in a cult. You must leave now, now. But that's not how we're supposed to do it. First Peter 3 talks about doing this in gentleness Jude 22 says, have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some, have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. That's the attitude you're supposed to have. James 5, 19 to 20 says, my brothers and sisters, if anyone among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that the one who has turned a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. You have a role, we all have a role to help each other guard the faith. Amen? And sometimes this can be hard because we don't have all the data. We have not researched, we don't have time to research these things and know exactly the depth of the false teaching. And that's why God has really blessed East Africa with a ministry called Africa Center for Apologetics Research. And that's really what we do. We spend our days and months researching these movements and trying to help inoculate people out of false teaching. And so it would help you if you get those resources to continue guiding yourself. Amen. And our table is out there, so feel free to stop by and ask questions and things of that kind. But the most important thing that I, w I don't want you to forget is that if you are grounded in the faith, 
and you're growing in grace, you will be able to guard the truth and the faith. That spiritual discernment is the antidote to deception. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are appropriately displeased with the proliferation of false teaching. Uh, we are appropriately angered and disillusioned sometimes by the rate at which false teaching spreads. Uh, but God, we know that the church of Christ will stand. It will stand the whims and the wrecks of false teaching. It will stand the schemes of the devil. And in this truth, O oh God, we place our firm foundation that nothing will hinder the progress of the gospel, not even false teaching. And I continue to pray thank with thanksgiving for the elders and the people of Grace Point who have continued in their fight for the truth and in the spread of the gospel. I pray, O oh God, that this place will be a pillar and buttress of truth. I plead with you, O oh God, for those who are either in false teaching right now or they know people who are trapped in cults and false movements, that God, you would remember mercy and that you would save them from the fire of the danger of false teaching. I pray, O oh God, that you would remember those very words, that we're reminded of those very words in Psalm 23, that you are our shepherd, that you will lead us in green pastures, able and perfect pastures where your word and only your word is preached. I ask these things in your name. Amen. God bless you all.